Okay, welcome to this video we are, where we are looking at all of the formulas that you need for the higher tier paper. Now in the previous video we looked at all of the formulas that you need that appear on the foundation and on the higher paper. So you do need to make sure that you check out that video as well as that video covers all of the rest of the formulas that you still need on the higher paper. But this video is going to look exclusively at those that you only need if you are sitting the higher paper. So if you are setting the foundation paper, go into the description and look at the other video, part one, looking at all the formulas that you need to pass your GCSE exam. Now if we quickly look at that video so you can see how it works, you can see that within the video, all of the links are in the description. So you can actually click onto the video and if you click the little link in the bottom left, it bookmarks everything for you. So you can scroll through the video and you can have a look at any of the vi uh, videos or formulas that you want to have a look at. You can then click back in the t into the description and all of those videos will be linked for you so that you can go and watch the full lesson. So hopefully that's gonna be really useful for you, but let's go back to our video. So as I said, this is going to be the higher only paper uh, formulas and with that being said, I'm the GCSE Math Tutor and let's have a look at our first formula. So the first formula that we're actually going to have a look at is going to be following on from the previous video and that is going to be the volume of a pyramid. Now the volume of a pyramid is equal to one third times the area of the base multiplied by the height. So if we look at an actual pyramid, we first need to think about the actual base. So the base here, and we're going to put some numbers in as we did on the previous video, we're going to see, say that the lengths of the base are 6 and 6. Now we also need to know the perpendicular height. So if we also put a perpendicular height in, and that is going from the peak of the pyramid down to the very centre of the square base, and we're going to say that that is 8. So the formula here, we would do one third multiplied by, the area of the base here is a square, so we would do six times six, and then we would multiply that by the height of eight, and that would look like this. Six times six, you could simplify to 36 if you want, although if you have a calculator, you can type that all in straight away. If you don't, a third of 36 is 12, so we'd have to do 12 times eight. And 12 times eight comes out as 96, and this is a volume, so we would say centimeters cubed. So that is our first formula. Let's have a look at our next one. Now the next one we're gonna have a look at is the quadratic equation. The quadratic equation is the nastiest looking out of all of them, in my opinion, but it is x is equal to negative b plus and minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And this is applicable to when we have a quadratic that is in this form, ax squared plus bx plus c, and when it is equal to zero. So when we are looking at a question like this, on a basic level, let's just have a look at one where it says solve the equation, and the equation is 3x squared plus 5x minus 4 is equal to 0, and we need to give our answer to two decimal places. So for this here, the first thing we look at is our values of a, b, and c, and they are the numbers highlighted in that particular order. So for this one, and we would write them down, a is 3, b is positive 5, and c is negative 4. And when we put that into our formula, we just need to be careful with some of those numbers. So as we can see in the actual formula, b, we have minus b to start with, so the b value, the, sim, the sign in front of it is going to change, and we just need to be careful about subbing some of them in. So as you can see in the way that I've subbed them in, I've also put the five squared in brackets there, and that is just to make sure in case b is negative, we don't get any errors on the calculator, and also I've put the negative four in brackets at the end. And I always do that when I'm substituting, I always put the negative number in a bracket. Now if you want to see more on this, obviously you can check out the full video on the quadratic equation, but going through this relatively quickly, we would type that into our calculator once using the plus sign, which gives us this answer, and once using the negative sign there in front of the square root, which gives us this answer. Now this actual question does say to give your answer to two decimal places, so we would round the first one to 0 0.59, and we would round the second one there to negative 2.26. Now they are our final answers, we would give both of them, and for the majority of questions using the quadratic equation, you are going to get two answers. So that's the quadratic equation, let's have a look at our next one. So now we're going to have a look at the sine rule. So the sine rule is 
a over sine a, which is equal to b over sine b, which is equal to c over sine c. And we use this when looking at triangles. Now specifically you would use this when looking at a non-right angled triangle, although it can actually be used with right angled triangles as well. But we already know from the previous video we can use Sokotoa or sin, cos and tan for looking at our right angled triangles. So if we throw some lengths into this triangle and think about why we would use sine with this particular triangle. Now when you are looking at them you want to identify pairs of opposites. So what I mean by that is that opposite the 30 degrees we have a length that we're looking for and we can call that a pair of opposites. And we can also look at the length that is opposite 62 and we can see that we have two pairs of opposites in this question. So that means we can use the sine rule. So all we need to do is label the sides. Now what I always do is I label A and B to start with. So let's just label this angle A and therefore its opposite side would be little a. We'll also label the 62B and therefore the opposite side is little b. And because of this process, we only ever actually need to use two of the pieces in our formula. So I'm never really going to use the equal C over sine C. Although that doesn't mean that we shouldn't label the sides as our other two sides will be big C and little c. Now if we put the values that we actually need into our equation, so the little a and the big A and the little b and the big B into our fractions there, we end up with something that looks like this. Now as you can see in that formula, we have got x on the top of the left hand fraction and we want it to say x equals. So we need to multiply both sides by sine 30. And if we multiply both sides by sine 30, the sine 30 would move onto the numerator on the right hand side. And again, if you're unsure on any of this, do check out the full video on the sine rule. When you plug that into the calculator, we get the answer 2.8314 and some extra decimals there. But if we round this to one decimal place for the purpose of our question, we would get the answer 2.8 centimetres. Now this is the sine rule for working out lengths. If you are going to work out an angle, there is a different formula where you flip the fractions over. So instead of it being a over sine a, you have sine a over a. And the same for obviously b and c. So again, if you're unsure on how to approach that, then do check out the full video where I go over this in depth. But with that being said, let's have a look at our next formula. So logically our next formula here is going to be the cosine rule. And the cosine rule is shown on the screen. And again, it's quite a long one. We have a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos a. And when we are looking at the cosine rule, again, we are looking at a triangle. And again, this is for looking at non-right angle triangles. But how does it differ from the sine rule? Well, if we put some lengths in and have a look at this, again, we'll have a look for those pairs of opposites. So we can already see that opposite the eight centimeters or the six centimeters, there is no angle. So if we look at this one to start with, opposite six, there is no angle. So we do not have a pair of opposites. But we can, can see that opposite the 60, there is the length that we're looking for. And we can include that as a pair of opposites. But unfortunately, the final one is not a pair of opposites. We have nothing opposite the eight. So this is our indication that we're going to use the cosine rule. Now, when I'm doing this, I always stick to using one version of the cosine rule where we have cos a at the end. And because of that, I always label the angle that I'm going to use in the question, my big A, and then the opposite side, little a. If otherwise, if you don't do this, you could end up having to learn three versions of the formula, which I wouldn't recommend, but is also a possibility. So if we start to label the other sides then, and you can put these in either order, but let's just call those B and let's call this angle C and the opposite length there, little c. And then we can actually just plug that straight into our formula. So putting all of the numbers in place, we end up with something that looks like this. So we have x squared is equal to six squared plus eight squared, which is our B and C. Take away two times six times eight cos 60. Now this is an interesting one because cos 60 is one of our exact trigonometric values and is equal to one half. And again, it's not necessarily one that you have to remember because you can actually work these out and you can check that out in obviously one of my videos on working out the exact trig values. But because cos 60 is equal to a half, when we put all these values into our calculator, we get quite a nice number, we get 52. Unfortunately though, the square root of 52 is not a nice number and we do get a long decimal, which again, I'm going to round to one decimal place. So we would say our answer here is 7.2 centimeters. And that is how you would use the cosine rule. 
Now when, again when it comes to the cosine rule you can rearrange it in order to look for an angle and the rearranged version here is that cos a is equal to b squared plus c squared minus a squared all over 2bc and when you are working out an angle you have to use the inverse of cos just like when you are doing any other versions of trigonometry. Again that can be seen in the full video on the cosine rule that I've got linked in the description. So let's have a look at our next formula, which is going to be the area of a triangle, specifically when we are using sine, and that is going to be half AB sine C. So we use this formula when we are unable to work out the height of the triangle. So if we throw some lengths into here, we can just say that the one angle is 30 and the other two there are 7 and 8. Now other angles and lengths could be given to you here, but I've made it the most basic question possible just to show you how to use the formula. Now you can see in the formula that the big C we are going to be using in this formula. So the angle that we're going to use, I'm going to label as C. So opposite that is little c, and the other two can be labeled in any order. So let's just put A and B in in either order. Now you just need to put these values into your calculator. So writing down the formula would give you 1 half times 7 times 8 times sine 30. And again, this is going to be an interesting question because it involves sine 30, which is one of our other exact trig values. Again, this comes out as 1 half. So cos 60 and sine 30 are our values that are given that are 1 half although some of the others are slightly more complex. But here, when we type that into our calculator, we get the answer 14. Again, that is the area, so we would give that in centimeters squared, and that would be our final answer for this question, 14 centimeters squared. Now, technically, that is all of the formulas that you need to remember, but there are some bonus formulas here that I thought were really important if you are sitting the higher tier paper. And the first of those is the area of a sector. And this follows on nicely from the last video looking at the area of a circle as it is pi r squared but we multiply it by the fraction of the circle we're looking at and that is given as theta over 360 where theta is the angle in the sector. So if we have a look at an example of a sector and we put in obviously we're going to need a radius which this time is the length shown on the screen so if we put the angle and the radius in we'll say it's 62 degrees with a radius of 8 we just put that into our formula which would be pi times 8 squared multiplied by and the angle there is 62 so 62 over 360. You can type that straight into a calculator and it gives you 34.627 but if we round that to let's say one decimal place again we get an answer of 34.6 again it's an area so that would be centimeters squared now that is for working out the area of a sector but you could also have to work out the arc length and if you have to work out the arc length it follows on nicely from circumference as it's pi times diameter again multiplied by the fraction of the circle that you're looking at again if you're not sure on this topic i will link the full video in the description for you moving on to our next formula we're going to look at direct proportion so with direct proportion, you have a formula which is x is equal to ky to the power of n. Now when looking at direct proportion, any letters could be used in the formula. So this is where x is directly proportional to y to the power of n. So an example of this would be if a question said x is directly proportional to y squared. When x is 18, y is equal to 6. And we want to find out the value of x when y is equal to 8. So we would say that x is directly proportional or equal to y squared or ky squared. And we're going to find the constant of proportion here. So we sub in those values 18 and 6 and we get 18 is equal to k times 6 squared. Then you can divide by 6 squared on both sides and you get the answer k is equal to a half. Now we can put a half back into our formula. So we would have that an x is equal to a half y squared rather than x is equal to ky squared. We can then plug in our final value. It says find the value of x when y equals 8. So if we put 8 in place of y, we would have that x is equal to a half times 8 squared. And we can work that out and we get the answer 32. Six, 8 squared is 64 and half of that is 32. Again, you can test this out on a calculator if you're unsure. But again, if you are needing to do a bit more work on direct proportion, again, the full video is in the description. Now we don't just have direct proportion, we also have inverse proportion. And the formula changes ever so slightly, as instead we have x is going to be equal to k over y to the power of n. Again, this is where x is inversely proportional to y to the power of n, but the process is very similar, and again, that is all linked in the description. 
onto our next formula, we're gonna have a look at when we're looking at a histogram and we're looking for frequency density. Now, when we are looking for frequency density, we use the formula that frequency over class width is equal to frequency density. And when we are looking at this, you would normally be given some grouped data in a table like the one shown on the screen. Now, the frequency is shown to you very clearly in the table and the class width you normally have to work out. And the class width is the distance between the two numbers there in the group data. At this particular example, the frequency is 8 and the distance from 0 to 10 is 10. So we would do 8 divided by 10 for our frequency density for that particular column, that particular row, sorry, and we would get the answer 0 0.8. Now you would have to go and work out the frequency density for the rest of those rows, but that would be how you would work out the first one. That would allow you to then plot the height of your bars for your histogram and move forward with the rest of the question, but also not forgetting that this formula can be rearranged if you are working backwards with a histogram. And again, if you're not sure on any of that, I will link the full video in the description for when you are wanting to look at histograms. Now we're going to move on to our final formula for this video, and that is looking at some coordinate geometry. So we're going to be specifically looking at the equation of a straight line. Now the equation of a straight line is written in the form y equals mx plus c. We also need to know a few other formulas for this, and that is looking at the gradient of a line. And the gradient of a line can be written as m is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. There are some different ways of writing that. You can write the change in the y coordinate over the change in x coordinate, or you could use the words rise over run. m is the letter that we use for gradient. And also you could potentially have to look at in the harder questions perpendicular gradients and you need to know that perpendicular gradients are the negative reciprocal of the other gradient shown above. So once we've worked out a gradient, if we're looking at a perpendicular line, we do negative one over that gradient. So let's look at an example question that involves all three, but again, all of these topics will be linked in the description for you. So we'll say that a line passes through the coordinates a, which is one five, and b, which is four eleven. And we're gonna find the equation of the line perpendicular to this line ab that passes through the point six seven. So the first thing we have to do is work out the gradient. And if you look at the points A and B, you can see that the Y coordinates are 11 and five. So if we did 11 take away five, that would be our change in Y, and four take away one would be our change in X. You can do that in either order as long as you follow the same order for both of those numbers. So our gradient would be 11 over take away five over four minus one. And that gives us a gradient of two. Now we're gonna be looking at the perpendicular line, so the perpendicular gradient would be negative one over two, or minus a half. And you can see that I've put a little p there with the m, which just explains that that is the perpendicular gradient. On to the next part of this, we'd look at the equation of the line. So now we can put our gradient in, we can say that y is gonna be equal to minus a half x plus c. We now want to substitute in a coordinate. So you have to pick the coordinate that the line passes through, and in this question it says it passes through six, seven. So if we sub those numbers in, we get seven, the y coordinate is equal to minus a half times six, which is the x coordinate plus c. We can then simplify the negative a half times six, which becomes negative three, and you can add the three over to the other side to isolate c, and you get a value of 10. Now you have the value for C, which is the y-intercept. You can put that back into the formula shown at the top, or the equation shown at the top, I should say, and that would give you a final equation of the line, which is y equals a half x plus 10. And that would be everything you would need for looking at coordinate geometry and the equation of a line. So that is just some bonus formulas there. There are other formulas that you could have a look at for particular topics, but these are the key ones you need to remember for the higher tier paper. So I hope you enjoyed that video. Hopefully it was useful and it was helpful. As always, please do leave a comment. Please do like the video and don't forget to subscribe to the channel and share this with your friends. Don't forget to go into the description and check out any lessons on any topics that you are unsure of. But there we go and I will see you for the next video.